the bathtub model, which we all have heard of. Maybe not everybody likes it. We heard about this last night. Uh, but I think it is a valid concept also for the interstellar medium because it's a must be true. It's just mass conservation. A mass flow through all phases of the interstellar medium and eventually it ends up in, in stars. And that's what we would like to understand. And of course, we will have Vadim a little bit later on to, to continue in this uh, context. And I would like to start with a motivation. The, if you look, if you talk to the star formation people, then they usually think, uh, if you want to understand star formation, you need to look at these densest parts of the interstellar medium, which are highly filamentary, and you study them, and then you can work out how many stars are forming on which time scale and so on and so on. And I would say this is a uh, complete garbage. Uh, this is the most boring part of the ISM and you will not understand anything about star formation if you just look at that. And I would like to motivate this with the following uh, two examples. So the first example is looking at the dense molecular gas. If you would say, okay, we have roughly three to eight solar masses of dense molecular gas in the Milky Way. And if this is all we need in order to understand star formation, uh, then we can easily work out how fast stars are forming in the interstellar medium. The dense molecular gas turns into stars on a free fall time scale. Uh, the free fall time scale is 4 to the 5 years for the dense gas. So you can write down the simple differential equation, you solve it, and you find that the dense gas mass uh, starts at t equals zero with some mass, which is three ten the eight, and then you get an exponential decay on a time scale of four ten the five years. And you can work out the star formation rate, it's the efficiency times uh, m dense over uh, the free fall time, and this is the collapse uh, rate, and you have a certain efficiency. And if you put in efficiencies of order 0.5 percent, I'll motivate this later on, you might say 0.5 percent in the dense gas, I will tell you exactly that's what we need, otherwise it wouldn't work. And then you get about four solar masses per year, but you have an exponential decay. And after four to five years or 10 to six years, the galaxy has run out of dense gas and star formation stops. So if you really want to understand star formation over time scale longer than the free fall time, which is nothing for us, dense molecular gas is not enough. Uh, it would be gone. So you need to think of something else to replenish it. And this something else is fundamental because otherwise you don't know how much dense molecular gas you have. Now you might say, okay, this is obvious. You know, in the whole galaxy, you need to replenish dense molecular gas. But can we use a box model, a closed box model for these individual filaments? Are they basically suddenly magically there? God made them exist and then they turn into stars? The answer is no. And the beautiful example is actually the most uh, detailed studied star cluster, the Orion cluster. If you look at the Orion cluster and if you look at the number of stars as a function of the age, you find an exponential distribution. And you can actually write this down as a star formation rate, which is the exponent of the time, the age of your stars, divided by 2 to the 6 years. Now, at first that appears to be an exponential decline as we have written up there, but well, there's a problem. The problem is there's a plus sign. And the plus sign means the longer you wait, the larger the star formation rate and not the smaller. So these are the youngest stars and these are the oldest stars. So star formation goes up and not down. And the second is this time scale is much larger than the free fall time. It's a different time scale. And you would never be able to work this out if you would just look at the dense gas. So there's something else going on. And that something else seems to be fundamental if we want to understand star formation in each single molecular cloud. And if we want to understand when the star cluster forms, is it an open cluster, a, more, a global cluster, whatever. All the details require something else. Now, what else do you need? Well, you need to take into account the fact that molecular clouds are not isolated, magically existing but that they are forming and that they continuously, while they form stars, are creating material. And so you have to add this innocently little parameter. And at first it appears as maybe that's not that different to what I have written up, up, up there. But if you look at the solution, what happens to the dense gas as a function of time, it's completely different compared to that. 
you can see if you solve this, then m dense is a constant, the accretion of it, let's assume it's constant times the free fall time of the dense gas times one minus the exponent. And you see there are two different solutions. If you look at a time uh, early on, which is shorter than the free fall time, you see that the dense gas mass is building up proportional to time. It's going up, your filament is growing and growing, and you can also see the star formation rate, which is dense over the free fall time, is also increasing with time. So it's indeed an increase in the star formation rate. But that only lasts for about a free fall time, and then for longer times, this becomes unimportant. It is very small. And then you find something completely different. The dense gas mass, the mass which you have in your filament actually, becomes constant. It's your accretion rate times the free fall time. And despite the fact that you are continuously forming stars, the mass of your filament is not changing anymore. The star formation rate also becomes constant. It's the efficiency times the accretion rate and assume that it's constant. So you find something quite unexpectedly. You see that the star formation rate in your filament is actually not at all dependent on the mass of your filament. And dense is not entering. And it also does not at all depend on your free fall time. The filament could have an enormously long free fall time of 20 giga years. The star formation rate wouldn't know about it. Uh, it's independent of that. What is, um, so the star formation is determined just by the product production rate of dense gas. As much as, yes? Yeah, sure, but all star forming, it's, it's, it's very, yeah, it's true. You're right. Uh, Joel, of course, you've got a good point, but the free fall time, fortunately, is fought in the five years. And so I just wanted to make a case, uh, you know, that you need to think beyond your box and maybe there's a universe where the free fall time is whatever and so on. So, yeah, but, but you're absolutely completely right. If this would be much, much longer, much longer than a star forming region exists, it would be different, but it's short. So the, in, the flow is important. And of course, the dense gas mass depends on the accretion and the star formation time scale. All of that depends on the accretion rate. So my summary is, if you want to understand star formation in a single cloud, if you want to understand a global cluster forming or anything, you need to understand the processes that drive the flow of gas through the different ISM phases. And if this flow is not understood, you'll never ever work out how stars form and you can peek into your star forming region and you have no idea what you're actually uh, talking about. So that is the motivation for the bathtub model in the ISM. And uh, I would now play it in a very simple way. I will use these two equations. Uh, I assume that stars are forming in the dense part. The dense mass is changing because it decretes. Mine is turning uh, collapsing. And the fraction of this collapse, uh, collapsing mass, which is the efficiency per free fall time, is turning into stars. The rest is blown away. That's my assumption. Where it goes and so on, this is something we can discuss. Okay, now let me now use this to think about a couple of ideas. The first question is, where is the source for the gas in these filaments? And of course, this is the densest part of a molecular cloud. And if you look carefully, you actually see a big environment, a big atmosphere. Of uh, this is Taurus. A, bl a black means uh, um, 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 optical depth, so to say. It's a dust. Dust. Uh, it's it, it's a dust map. Yeah, basically, this is uh, extinction. Extinction by dust. Yeah, and so and the, and and these courses are the stars we've seen. Yes, the dusty molecular gas exactly, and you see there's this big reservoir of diffuse molecular gas. You can also see it's turbulent. You see this kind of whirl, for example, it's a kelvin helmholtz instability, and all kinds of things. And this diffuse gas has a mean density of 100 particle per cubic centimeter. The dense gas has a mean density of 10 to the 4 particles per cubic centimeter. And the interesting thing is, if you look at any star forming region, count how much mass you have in the diffuse reservoir and how much mass you have in the dense reservoir, it's always a factor 10. The diffuse mass is always a factor 10 larger than the dense mass. 
And the question is, of course, why is that so? And that's not only true for a local star forming region. This is actually a compilation. You really need to read this paper. I don't even try to pronounce the name uh, V something. Uh, um, but it's a wonder, wonderful paper because they looked at star forming regions in the Milky Way and other galaxies. And, they, and this is the correlation between the dense mass and the diffuse mass and it's always a factor 10. This is already interesting and we want to understand why it is so. And I'll tell you, the bathtub model can explain it. Thank you. Uh, another interesting factor is how much mass in stars do you have compared to the dense gas mass? And you would at first think in the dense gas mass the efficiency is higher. But you see it's not the case. If I calculate the mass of stars I see in the dense part, it's again 10%. So you wonder, why is this the same? And of course, you can then work out an efficiency. If you just look at the mass of stars I see compared to the total molecular gas, then the efficiency is 1% because it's, of course, dominated by this. But you would at first argue, OK, on average, the efficiency is 1%. But if I focus only on the dense part, star formation is efficiency of 10%. And I tell you, it's a, a completely garbage. Because in a bathtub model, you cannot do it that way. The reason is, the mass of stars you see is the star formation history of the past. The mass of dense gas which you see is the star formation history of the future. Why should the currently present molecular gas tell you uh, is correlated to how many stars formed in the past? That only works if you have a closed box and you turn the gas into stars which was available. But if you have a flow into the region, this doesn't tell you anything about that, or that doesn't tell you anything about that. So there must be something else giving you this 10%. And it needn't be the efficiency of the past star formation. So let me now try to work that out. And the other one is, of course, and I think that is really amazing, if you look at the mass of young stars, whether the mass of dense gas you see in star forming region, the need of these points is a star forming region, you see it's a linear relationship, as I said, which means the more dense gas I have, the even more stars I have, or turn it around, the, the more stars I have, the even more gas I have to form stars. And that is just opposite of what you would think. You turn the gas into stars, the mass of the gas goes down, the mass of the stars goes up. It should be anti-correlated, but it's correlated. And that's beautiful because that's exactly what we see in the star forming main sequence. The more stars we have, the even more gas we have to form more stars. The same linear relation, not the anti-correlation. And that's why the bathtub model which we are playing for galaxies also works for each single individual star forming region. So now let me now explain uh, this kind of correlation a little bit in the last, uh, uh, he's working. Uh, go keep, keep on working, uh, uh, eight minutes. Um, oh, I should not have disturbed you, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so, uh, oh, yeah, 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 so, my mistake. <laughs> now we're turning off the bomb. <laughs> okay, so let me now play this a little more. So we solve this equation, and then we look at how the gas mass evolves with time in our bathtub. Well, you see, the, this is the mass of the gas normalized to the equilibrium value, which is down there. And this is the dense gas mass. And you see initially you have the linear rise, and then you get a constant factor. And if you do this for the star formation rate as function of time, and you solve this, then of course this is now the equilibrium value. I normalized it. Uh, this is log of the equilibrium star formation rate as summit to the equilibrium. You have again the linear rise as we expect, and then you get your uh, constant factor. So in that sense, this is, of course, what we have been discussing before. But there's something very, very interesting. Uh, what is interesting is that the stellar mass is not achieving a constant value. The stellar mass is continuously increasing with time. So the dense mass becomes constant. The stellar mass is increasing. And there is a time in it. So you have a clock. Because we know how many stars we can form. At the end, 10% of what we have in dense gas has to be in stars. That's what we see. And that gives us a certain time, t, which we require in order to get this. And in this case, we can see it over here. This is 10% of our more dense molecular gas. 
This is how the star formation, how the mass of stars is increasing with time, and these are different efficiencies. And you see, if you would take this efficiency, you would reach your limit at a time which is roughly a few freefall times, which is less than 10 to 6 years, and that is never observed. Star forming regions usually have of order 5, 10 to 6 to 10 to 7 years time scale. And that means we need something in this region. And you see immediately this is only possible if the efficiency of star formation in the dense component is tiny, 1%. And actually, you can do this in more details. This is the gas, uh, the, the, the mass of stars to gas mass in the dense regions observed. This is now on, on a certain time, uh, the, the time in mega years. This assumes the free fall time is 14 to 5 years. And if you want to be in this ball part uh, for typical ages of star forming regions which are over there, then you predict that the efficiency of star formation in the dense molecular gas can only be 0.5%. And that is much, much smaller than what you naively assume if you would just simply count how many stars you see and how much mass you have in molecular gas. Where does the rest of the gas go? It is blown away by feedback. And you see it in H2 regions and whatever, there's a continuous flow of gas into the star forming region and a continuous outflow like a galactic wind, but now it's a filamentary wind or whatever you want to call it. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is this uh, curious relation between dense gas and diffuse gas, which is 10%. Can we explain this? And indeed, we can explain it within the Bastard model very nicely. Dense gas has a density of 10 to 4. Diffuse gas has a density of 100. So the free fall time of the diffuse gas is 10 times the free fall time of the dense gas. And that means it's 14 to 6 years. Uh, and now you can do the falling. If you are in the equilibrium, and we are always in the equilibrium because the diffuse time scale is much longer than the dense time scale, so things change on time scales which are quite long. Uh, the Bastard model says that the mass of dense gas is the accretion rate times the free fall time of the dense gas. But the accretion rate is the mass of the diffuse gas divided by the free fall time of the diffuse gas. And so you see the mass of the dense gas to the mass of the diffuse gas is just uh, the ratio of their free fall times. And this is 0.1, because uh, this is the ratio, uh, the square of the ratio of the densities. And so naturally, wherever you have to look, the dense gas will only be 10% the diffuse gas, whatever the mass of the diffuse gas. It's a natural result of an equilibrium faster model. So you now can put it all together and you work out the depletion time scale of gas in a whole galaxy. We know where well, this is of order 10 to 9 years. I now go to redshift zero. And uh, we just worked out the M dense over M diffuse is given by these time scales, which is 10%. This total star formation rate is the efficiency of dense gas times the mass in dense gas divided by the free fall time of the dense gas. But this is equal to the mass of the diffuse gas divided by the free fall time of the diffuse gas. And, uh, as the diffuse gas is much more than the dense gas, this is roughly the mass of the whole molecular gas in the Milky Way. And so if you look at this, then you immediately come up with a depletion time. So this is the mass of molecular gas divided by the depletion time by definition, because that's the star formation rate. And so you find the depletion time of molecular gas in the whole galaxy is the free fall time of the diffuse gas divided by the efficiency of star formation in the dense gas. So it's, you need to combine both to get it right. Now this is 14 to 6 years, this is 0 0.005, out comes 10 to 9 years. You do not need any tumor parameter, nothing like that, it's a local process, and so the depletion time uh, can, must be like that for present-day galaxies because of these kind of uh, things over there, which again are a result of the past time. It's as easy as that. Now I have uh, still uh, 20, 20 seconds. Uh, so let me go to one additional application, which I find uh, most exciting. Um, this is the Orion cluster and the Orion nebula. Not only the Orion cluster, which sits in the Orion nebula. This is the Orion nebula. And I would like to focus very quickly on this filament over there, which has been studied in great details. As I told you, Orion is one of the best studied star forming regions, prototype star forming regions, and I want to use the bathtub model, thank you, uh, to um, 
thank you for excusing yourself uh, uh, to explain it. Okay, so there has been a very nice recent study of the age distribution of stars in Orion. And what they found is actually three peaks of star formation. So three episodes of star formation in Orion uh, with a certain time. So the first episode was the most efficient, 3,500 3, solar mass of stars formed three million years ago. The second population is 1,000 solar mass, two million years ago. And the third population is 200 solar masses, 1.2 mega years ago. That's why they call it the tale of three cities. And uh, you also see that the first population is more extended than the second, and the third is most condensed. So the question is, can we explain this within the bathtub model? And 2,000 solar masses of gas are left behind. And you can work out what accretion you need according to the bathtub model to get it right. And you come up with this fascinating accretion rate. The formation of this of Orion had to follow this kind of a distribution over here. So basically an exponential decline as a function of time with a freefall time uh, of the diffuse gas, which is eight in the five years. And you need a periodic variation with a period which is uh, um, also eight in the five years. Don't tell me why it is. It just simply has to be so. And if you do this, then you predict this kind of gas evolution. This is present time and the blue dot is actually the presently observed gas. And you predict the star formation rate, which is precisely then of course what they find. And this is a total accumulate, cumulative mass of stars. So this is what they observe. And indeed, it works very nicely. And so this is a model which can explain the history of Orion in a simple way. You need an efficiency of 0 0.0085. So that is working very nicely. But this has a couple of problems. Well, okay, I can't do this uh, total, um, uh, total thing over here because we're at the end of our thing. First of all, yeah, no, I can't do it. I'll do the following. What is the problem? Well, the problem is that the free fall time of the diffuse gas to the dense gas is not 10. In Orion, it is 4. And the second problem is that if you work out how much accretion you had four in the five years after the beginning, it turns out to be one solar mass per year. Uh, um, and uh, this is actually, uh, you can work out uh, that this requires an enormous amount of diffuse gas of 10 to 6 solar mass suddenly being available to collapse with this short collapse time scale uh, within a couple, kind of 10 to 5 years. And so the question is, how can you do this? And I found no model that can explain how you suddenly get at that amount of diffuse gas. And I was greatly getting worried because Orion is the best studied, most prototype star forming regions, till I come up, came up with this image. And this image completely changed my mind. It turns out Orion is not in the plane, in the galactic plane. Orion sits 150 parsecs below the galactic plane in a region where you usually have no molecular gas. And if you look at Orion, it, here's the galactic plane. It's actually looking like a bubble. And there's an old pa uh, paper by Pepe Franco who said, this thing formed by a high velocity cloud crashing through the disk, sweeping up the material and forming this bubble. And that explains, of course, the short time scale. And that explains why you suddenly get 10 to 6 solar masses of gas collapsing. So I think our best studied star forming region, the prototype of what everybody uses, is the worst case to actually take. It's like the Milky Way, which has been found to be completely weird. Yeah? But we take the Milky Way as the best studied galaxy, but somehow the Milky Way doesn't behave as you want it to behave. So I just want to tell you the bathtub model has a lot of potential. You can learn a lot about a little individual star forming regions. You can learn a lot about global star formation in the galaxy. So please use it in the future. Thank you very much.